Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you so much, Alexa. And um, thank you to everyone for inviting me. Um, I'm really, really pleased to be here. I'm a real ocean person. And so it's, it's exciting to be with a group of marine focused people. So I'll start out here. Um, I too would really like to acknowledge um, the Lekwungen peoples on whose traditional territory I'm lucky enough to live and the Songhees, Esquimalt and Wasonic peoples whose historic relationships with this amazing place continue to this day. I should tell you that I'm, uh, I'm in my backyard in Victoria, British Columbia, and you might see some runner ducks go by. Uh, they live in this backyard and they, they tend to move around a fair bit. It's a super windy day here today. So you might also see some wings flapping and that sort of thing. They really love this kind of weather uh, or they seem to love this kind of weather. So I thought we could start off with this icebreaker poll um, to really ask you about this question of eco-anxiety in your own life, your own personal life. How big an impact is it having on you and in your work life? So if you wouldn't mind answering the poll, I'm going to continue on. And then Alexa, maybe you could let us know the results. Does that feel okay? Okay, perfect. Thank you. Now, the reason I asked you this is that... Um, these kind of comments are comments that I frequently run into from students and um, you know, non-students when they're thinking about climate, this feeling of that, that hope is really delusional or, or it's somehow missing the point. And we know from studies like this one that just came out in September, 2021, that three in four young people, and so this is a study of 16 to 25 year olds across 10 different countries, um, they feel really that the future is frightening and these feelings of being betrayed by governments or the feeling that not enough is being done. Um, as I said, the largest of these, um, so far the largest research to date, showing these profound impacts on people in that age group and not just that age group. Um, this study was for youth, but really we see this issue of eco-anxiety crossing many different age groups. Um, part of what I think is important to notice here is this feeling of fatalism that underscores it. And climate doom is a fatalistic view. It's the sense that there is nothing we can do that will actually resolve this problem, that the future is already set. And what I'm hoping to do in this conversation today is, is open up this idea um, and really sort of tackle the question of fatalism, because I think it's very impactful and, and it's one we really need to be thinking about. So Ellen Field, who's at Lakehead University, uh, did a national study of teachers and students in 2020. And she found that across grade seven to grade 12, students were really aware of climate change. They really knew it was caused by humans. And 46% of them, that's a huge number, felt there's nothing that can be done to change it. So again, this fatalistic um, concern around it. In my own work, I'm often asking students their feelings about the about the state of the planet, about climate change. And if you look in this case, I'm contrasting on the right are the comments made in a, for a research study. Um, this academic was asking crisis reporters while they are reporting on earthquakes and famines and school shootings, how they feel. And on the left are words that students have shared with me in a classroom. So I just am, am trying to highlight how strongly these feelings are and how diverse those feelings are. Those of you working in the kind of work that you're doing are at a higher risk of these feelings of, of eco-anxiety and, and in some ways this fatalistic hopelessness um, because you're inundated in the work that you're reading about, in the reports that you're following, um, you're hearing lots about the issues themselves. And so this is work by Penu Pakala, who's in Finland, who I am going to work with next year, showing just how important that inundation is on, on you and sometimes the people you're interacting with because of, of really being inundated in that way. And one of the things that contributes to this is that in our education, when we go through environmental studies or marine studies or, or environmental communication, this tends to happen. You know, the problems are so important, they're so urgent, and that's true, that we, we hear lots about the problems and we never get to the second half where we are get focused on solutions or it comes really at the very end as a tiny little piece, you know, maybe a, a comment in the last core class. So this whole focus on problem identification ends up creating a lot of emotional um, reaction. 
And so one of the ways of, of really thinking about that is to think, how am I intentionally creating safe spaces to share feelings, both for myself and for the people I'm working with or the people I'm learning with? So one of the things that um, I've been proud to be involved with in this last year has been this creation of an international network of academics and practitioners who are dealing with the emotional landscape of climate justice. And so we've put together this existential toolkit, which is a whole series of resources coming from many different people around how we create those kind of safe spaces and how we talk about these issues. So one of the things in there, for example, is a reference to an emotional resilience toolkit for climate work. And within that um, is, is an activity like this one where we might stand together, two people or two people in the Zoom breakout room and share, you know, how have you been feeling lately about climate activism or about the, the future or those kinds of questions? And then in the second half, we turn to each other and ask about self-care. And so I was really interested, and if you wouldn't mind, just adding to the chat, what, what perhaps have you done for self-care in this past week? So we can get a sense of the kinds of self-care practices that are helpful to us, and we can see them collectively. So if you wouldn't mind putting that into the chat, I would really appreciate it. Another way, in addition to creating safe spaces, is really celebrating our interconnections, you know, with this broader than human world. And, and one of the things I have the pleasure of doing is I'm a children's book author, and all of my books are based on first person interviews with scientists, so that I have the most current scientific information I can get. Um, but I'm really, really drawn by this correlation between ourselves and other species. So in a last goodbye, I'm looking at the way that other uh, intelligent social animals uh, actually do mourn and grieve around um, situations like illness or end of life. So in this case, I will cry out in sorrow, hold you tight or watch in quiet sadness. So we know that gorillas do these things, that hyenas do these things. And that book is written in a way that allows us to think of our own reactions at the same time as a reaction of other species. In your stardust, um, my intention here is to really get across the idea that we are just nature, no matter what we're doing, you know, even when we're caught in a traffic jam, we just are. And so I interviewed a palynologist who are the people who study how pollen moves around. And we know that butterflies are pollinators and that hummingbirds are pollinators, but it's true also of us. So your breath is alive with the promise of flowers. Each time you blow a kiss to the world, you spread pollen that might grow to be a new plant. So just recognizing these incredible connections that we have to the beyond human world. You know how it feels to be a good friend and so do other animals. Bats and sperm whales get their friends to babysit. Elephants remain best buddies for life. You, me, birds flying through the rainforest. We are all connected. We are all nature. Part of the way that I think we can really do self-care and recognize um, these connections is by spending as much time as we can outside. So of course I'm speaking to you outside. I try to do all of my work uh, in that way outside. There's so much evidence coming up in, in recent years around how important time spent in nature, time spent outside in cities um, is for our mental well-being, for our emotional well-being and for our physical health. So as I said, I try to write outside, I eat outside, I shower outside, I sleep outside, uh, this, um, I teach outside. And this is what teaching looked like uh, before COVID. I was very lucky to be teaching in some beautiful outdoor settings. And this is how it's been looking in you know, the recent years. So even though we still are online, I try to teach everything outside. And I encourage the students to do that too, hosting meetings outside. Often um, I'll ask students to both be on WhatsApp. And so even if they're not in the physical same place, they can be walking outside and having conversations in that way or doing an activity in their own environment that they're sharing with another person or with a group. And of course, uh, real awareness of walking meetings, how important they are um, gathering together in those ways. It's just a way of keeping our connections even when we're doing the kinds of busy work that I know you're all engaged in. This all matters because there's more and more research showing that our subjective beliefs, what we believe about something impacts objective reality. And just a beautiful recent example of this coming from the University of Pittsburgh shows that if you believe the COVID-19 uh, vaccine has a positive impact, that statistically there's a higher immune response to that vaccine. And this is coming from work from the Mind-Body Lab at Stanford University 
Um, but there's a lot of work in the medical profession around this whole subjective beliefs and objective reality piece. And I think it's really relevant to our engagement with climate. What we believe has an impact on what we think is possible and what actually does happen. So our feelings are really based on the reality of the situation. We are in a climate emergency. Uh, these are urgent issues of a global proportion. We know of so many other marine issues that I know you're involved with, as am I. Um, so our feelings are based on those realities, as well as our thoughts and our beliefs and our mindsets and, and how we communicate things. And what I wanted to highlight here is that um, the number one way that most of us learn about the environment is through the media. And we know from journalistic studies that almost all the information we hear about the media is in this problem identification frame. And it tends to be in a very uh, highly emotive images like this. And so one of the issues that results from that is, well, one of the reasons that happens is that problems are actually deemed more newsworthy than solutions. So it's very helpful to know that when you are looking at media around the issues that you care about, you're mostly hearing about the problems and you aren't very often hearing about any of the solutions that are actually happening. And why that's an issue is that for reasons like this, that when you continue to hear only about the problems, it can really create this feeling of disengagement and disempowerment and these feelings of fatalism. So they're actually being constructed by the way that we are engaging with the knowledge that we're seeking to get. And that's exacerbated by the fact that we live in this 24 seven you know, cycle where we get all of our information on our personal devices. And in 2020, for example, the word doom scrolling was one of the words of the year because we find ourselves moving from one negative story to the next to the next. Now, why that matters so much is that um, emotions are contagious, both face-to-face -face and online. So as we're doom scrolling and sharing what we're seeing, we're actually spreading these feelings of, of despair and hopelessness. And our world and data, which is a wonderful sort of big data aggregate um, organization out of the University of Oxford has been charting this rise of cynicism around the world um, that is in part fueled by the ways in which we engage with information. Now, it makes a lot of sense that we have been so focused on, on letting people know about the problems because, as I said, these are urgent problems that need to be dealt with. And because we were very aware of uh, that people weren't very aware of climate change or, or the issues around it. But in the past decade, that has really shifted. And if you look at lots of surveys from many different countries, um, including this poll from 2021, what we find is that people are much more aware of climate change and increasingly uh, concerned about it. And so as a result of that, uh, we end up with what Tony Lesowitz at Yale University calls this hope gap. So the space between people's legitimate fears about climate change and their feelings of powerlessness to do anything about it, because they continue to just hear what a problem it is. So again, here's a poll for us. And, and I guess, Alexa, maybe the way we can do the polls is we can look at the results all at the end together. Is that okay for everyone? Um, so in this case, I wondered, you know, do you recognize a hope gap in yourself? Is this something that, that you're contending with? One of the things I think to highlight here is that if you look across the psychological literature around how we really engage with, with difficult issues like plastic pollution or climate change, We've typically used fear and shame as our, our number one way to try to engage people. But in that psychological research, what we really find is more powerful to help us stick with something when it's really hard to do are things like pride and a sense of meaningful engagement and our relationships to other people and compassion, including self-compassion and self-care and empathy. So these kinds of things um, are, are really how we stay with things. And so, one of the ways of practicing self-compassion and, and releasing our anxiety a little bit is by moving our bodies. And so I was thinking, if you wouldn't mind, um, I might ask you if you will move your body a little bit. And, and as I was wandering around my house thinking, what's a good way to inspire you to move your body? I live with a chihuahua and my chihuahua frequently uh, shakes off stress when she's dealing with giant dogs and that sort of thing. So I'm going to show you a video of her shaking off her stress. And then I'm going to encourage you to stand up for a moment and shake off 
whatever you're feeling, okay? So let's see if this will work for us. So here is Cookie Dough shaking off her stress. Look at that airtime she's getting. <laughs> okay. Would you be willing to stand up and shake off some of your own stress? I'll do it too. And I'll play her again so you can see it. <laughs> okay, shake out your arms, shake out your, try and get your feet off the ground, shake off your head, see how it feels. It does feel good. Whew, I can't get the same hang time she can. But just even recognizing our bodies and how we're holding them in those ways. And this example, um, comes from, um, sorry, now I have to get out of this somehow. Let's see if I could do that. Uh, comes from that existential toolkit. Uh, it's one of the examples in there. So there are, are really practical things like that to help us along our way. So because emotions matter so much, I'm really interested in evidence-based hope, which is facing the realities of the situation. So absolutely grounded in what is actually happening and challenging this fatalistic idea that we already know as a foregone conclusion. So accepting that we don't really know what's going to happen, that the world is incredibly complex and all kinds of things are at play. And from our world and data, we find this kind of research that shows that when we have a good knowledge about how the world has changed, we tend to be more optimistic about the changes that we can achieve in the years ahead. And it comes from that grounding in really current information. And so a lot of my work is focused in this area, is, is recognizing that to tackle this hope gap, we really need to, to think about time-sensitive, time-content, evidence-based solutions so that we can see trends that are moving in the ways we need them to move in and amplify them. And I, I often say to people, you know, if I were speaking to you about sports or about politics, I wouldn't come on this Zoom without kind of looking to see what the score was yesterday or you know who's in power and what they've been saying. But often I would argue when we talk about environmental issues or climate change, we don't think to look for what's just happened or what's been going on just in the last few days because we kind of make an assumption, I think, that everything was good and it's gotten terrible. So we almost don't have to look for solutions or things that have gone in a different direction. And, and I would argue that we really have to get into that practice. Um, so actively seeking out solutions journalism related to the issues that you care about is an important way of tackling that hope gap. And I'm happy to say that in the last decade, there's been this growth of a, this whole field called solutions journalism. You can look on their solutions story tracker. Um, and what solutions journalism is doing is it's looking just as critically at what works as it looks at what's broken. And, and that matters. So it looks at it within the context of that place. It's not just good news reporting. It's actually a critical analysis of what solutions are having impacts and why they are having impacts. So they did a massive um, treatment, for example, on school shootings in the United States and, and what efforts are actually having the kinds of positive impacts we need to have around that crucial issue. What they found, or what others have found looking at solutions-based news is that when we engage in that way, we're much more likely to have engagement with an issue because we've learned not only about what's broken, but much more about what we can do about it and what could have the impacts that we wanna see or are having those impacts. There are a number of sources of solutions-based things. This is one of my favorite podcasts from the BBC. Um, the Guardian and the New York Times both have uh, regular editorials in a solutions orientation. I co-created in 2014 a hashtag to crowdsource and share examples of ocean successes and solutions from around the world. And I'm happy to say it's been very active and is now active in different languages, which is exciting to me. Um, one of the women who co-created that with me uh, went on to create a whole earth optimism uh, movement at the Smithsonian Institution, which includes big summits now of speakers, as well as a lot of social media. And these are just some of my favorite sources for solutions oriented content. My current very favorite is The Grist. Uh, they have a, a weekly newsletter called The Beacon, which you can source um, ongoing examples of things that are moving in ways that, that matter. And I wondered again if in the chat, so Alexa, who kindly put together this meeting, these are some of her favorite sources for solutions focused marine content. And I wondered if you would be willing to share some of yours in the chat. Like, Where do you go when you're trying to look at things that are moving in the direction they should be moving in? 
Now, Project Drawdown is one that many of you will be familiar with. It's a big data aggregate, and it tries to look at you know, what are the major things that we can do collectively that would have the biggest impact on climate change? And I just wanted to point to refrigerant management, which is the number one way, one that they manage, that they uh, bring forward. And to show, so here's from the GRISC, from the Beacon. On May 4th, um, President Biden um, made a big announcement around those very uh, refrigerants. So he's making that announcement. And what I think is important in this idea of, of keeping track of trends is that back in 2016, 170 countries signed on to the Kigali Agreement to deal with refrigerants. So they've been working on this issue for the past five years or so. And why I think that's so relevant is that same group is the group that historically has been so successful with the ozone problem of the ozone hole. So it makes a difference when we see this kind of movement that it's, it's not at, at the sort of starting line place that it's actually movement is going on and these things need to be amplified and groups are working on them so that we see that this isn't all ahead for us. So here's another poll question for you. How often do you work from a solutions orientation in your job? How often are you coming at it from that standpoint? All of this is because I think we often suffer from the starting line fallacy. So we, we typically say when we're talking about climate change or other environmental issues, if we do this, then these things will happen. And what that does is it makes us think that all of the hard work is ahead. You know, we're just at the starting line and we're in this 12 year time pressure and you know, we probably won't get there fast enough. But if we change our language and talk about, as I did with the Kigali agreement, because we have done this, now we are here and this is where we're trying to get to. It really changes our sense that we are part of a bigger surge of movement. And remember when I was saying earlier about what really engages us is sense of pride and meaningful purpose and being part of something bigger. Hope really operates in a collective frame. And so when we look at, for example, these climate change marches, which were just so instrumental in 2019, it's important that we know that by 2020, one in 10 people on the planet now live in a place that has declared a climate emergency. That's a huge influence of a global movement. Now, of course, we have to push for, you know, what are the plans that come out of that emergency and what ways are they being enacted? But it's important to see that amount of response, because if we don't think to, you'll probably hear the ducks are joining in here. Um, I hope you can still hear me. Um, if we don't think to look for change, we often fail to see that it's happening. <laughs> I think they really agree with that, perhaps. <laughs> and, and one example of change that I find really encouraging is that when President Biden joined office in, um, you know, just this last year, one of the very first things he did was rejoin the Paris Accord. Now that's really important from a climate change perspective, of course, but it also shows here is a president joining a highly divided country, highly politically divided. And the fact that he chose climate change as his first action shows that climate change has moved from being a divisive issue in the United States to being a unifying issue in the United States. That's a huge shift in perspective um, in not that much time. One of the things that happened with COVID-19 is that we underwent what they call in journalism, a media eclipse, which means that we almost only heard about COVID and we heard very little about other issues. And it led many people to think climate change had kind of, we had all the marches and then everyone lost interest in it. But actually, if you look at the research, climate change stayed a high level of concern throughout our experience of COVID and has increased in levels of concern um, over that time. And one of the places where we can see this is that I, I used to always go to scientific pages to look for my examples uh, to share with you. I now find myself increasingly in the financial pages because we see this reaction in terms of what investors and shareholders are demanding of companies and, and, and other financial institutions. We see shifts like this from banks. And you'll notice that all of my slides have dates on them um, intentionally so that you can see how these things are moving and changing with time. Just back in July of this year, we see the World Bank uh, focusing much more heavily on these nature-based solutions, which are something that the youth justice movement has been asking for very loudly. And we see um, companies such as these listed below who have 
signed on to the Paris Accord, but to do it 10 years faster. So a lot of movement um, in this area that we want to pay attention to. Uh, close to where I am right now, the University of Victoria has just recently announced its divestment uh, from fossil fuels, and that's part of a much bigger movement across universities across Canada um, to do the same thing and across other countries as well. We also see things like this. So the shift from what was the largest public company on earth, which was a fossil fuel company to a renewables company. And close to where I live part of the time in California, uh, the city of Petaluma has just banned gas stations. They can't make any new gas stations and they can't add any pumps to their existing gas stations. They can only add charger stations. So things are really shifting uh, in, in ways that are important. Um, some of you will be following this in, in Europe, this movement of, uh, because trains are so much more effective in terms of the climate change impact than short haul flights. Uh, Austria and France now banning short haul flights if there's a, a train that you could take instead and other European countries uh, joining alongside. And of course, one of the big impacts of climate change you will have been probably very aware of is bicycling has just taken off with cities putting in bicycle routes with the purchase of bikes, with the movements of bikes, um, a really positive development. So again, when we look at net zero pledges, for example, back in 2019, 77 countries had sign on to net zero um, by 2050. And here we are in 2021 and we have 137 countries signing on. We have to push for what that means. We have to move it closer to 2030. We have to do a lot of work, but that's a big jump in terms of, of joining in and the impacts that that will happen. And here are some trends that I think are really quite active right now that, that you might find of interest. Um, marine protected areas, whale recovery, sustainable seafood, specifically in the ocean area, single-use plastic work. Um, uh, just right now in the harbor here in Victoria, Boyan Slat, who's been doing the Great Pacific Garbage Patch work that many of you have been following probably for the last seven or eight years, um, is just in our harbor right now because they are actually able now to harvest waste. So a huge jump forward in that project and, a, and an exciting time. So when we track where things are moving, uh, we see that kind of change. And as I said, because emotions are contagious, keeping track of these positive trends and then actively sharing them is a super important way of dealing with eco-anxiety and forwarding climate engagement. Something that um, I have found really helpful with many students, and you might wanna do it just on a personal basis, is this emotions journal. Uh, so give yourself a personal assignment. And in this assignment, I ask students to spend 30 minutes outside and just recording their feelings of they can be walking to work or whatever they wish to be doing. And then 30 minutes, just spending time with solutions uh, journalism sources as an intentional practice and doing that 10 days in a row. Um, and students then record how they feel about their time outside and how they feel about what they're reading about or watching. And, and they really notice a shift in their feelings uh, tied with just those two activities. Now, I know all of you are interested in the marine environment, so I know you think about other species on earth, but often when we're talking about climate change, we get very human focused, you know? And it's helpful to think about the fact there are 8.7 million other species on earth that have incredible capacities and agencies. And one thing that I've been really buoyed by myself is this comeback of, of many whale species, including humpback whales. Humpback whales, all populations, except I think two. And if there's someone on the call who knows if I'm incorrect, please let me know. I really appreciate it. Anyway, they're making a, a global comeback. Uh, we just had this report uh, three days ago here off the Salish Sea, where I'm currently sitting. You know, 25 years ago, no humpbacks uh, in the Salish Sea, and now we have, you know, over 521 record number of calves this year. That's exciting change because as whale populations rebound, you'll know as marine people, that's good for the whole ocean ecosystem. It's good for fisheries. Um, and now we see uh, a growing interest in this case from the World Bank, recognizing whales in terms of climate remediation, because as whales move up and down in the water column, they take phytoplankton up to the surface that captures carbon and whales are actually a very important $2 million per whale important in terms of their impact on climate change. 
Um, back in 2008, I had the challenge and pleasure of uh, working on a project to try and convince then President George Bush to establish the world's largest marine protected area in the Marianas Trench. I'm happy to say because of many people's hard work that actually happened. It was the first ecosystem scale marine protected area and I believe it's now the 12th largest or something like that. So I'm very happy to be getting farther and farther behind uh, because we do want these massive scaled marine protected areas. What matters about that is that as we do more of that, um, you know, we see the impact, we see uh, larger numbers. And because we can now study that from a scientific standpoint, we're able to see that when marine protection is put in place, um, it has positive impacts on, on fisheries and other um, ecologically oriented issues that we care about. Now, I'm in no way saying that marine protected areas aren't full of, you know, we have to work on monitoring, we have to think about their protection and how protected are they? And all of those kinds of issues are absolutely true, but the general trend towards more of them of a greater size is also true and really important. And similarly on land, it's exciting to know that since 2010, um, you know, the amount of land on earth, seven times the size of India has been protected. That's really an important trend. And here we're talking about 17% in 2021, now the big push coming into the climate change uh, meetings and the biodiversity meetings is for 30% by 2030. That's the number that people are going after. To me, that's thrilling because when I was working on the project for George Bush, or to convince George Bush, it wasn't for him, um, that uh, you know we were talking about a couple of percentage points and now we're talking about 30%. Um, we see these kinds of pledges coming from world leaders. So when we're thinking about visualizations that when we're communicating with people, we so often show the decline of something. And I think it's really important to include evidence-based things that are moving in the directions we need them to be going in and, and showing people that this action does make a difference. I was really thrilled in September to see this. Um, many of you will know tuna are one of the hardest uh, groups of, of animals to be able to try to protect because they are hugely migratory. They move across international boundaries. They're the number one fish we eat. And they are, uh, you know, the tuna fisheries is plagued by high, high cost uh, human rights challenges. It's a really complicated uh, fisheries. And yet we see, thanks to many hardworking international collaborations over the last 20 years, this kind of positive direction. So it matters to keep track of those. Because someone did this, now we're here rather than that future orientation. So because people did this in South Korea, we're now in this situation. Um, the way we're gonna get to that 20, that 30% by 2030 is not just by protecting areas that are still in their natural state, but by ecological restoration. And that's why these kind of big projects are really worth paying attention to and talking about. Um, we know that when the Elwa River Dam was removed, that salmon moved back into the area within a couple of days, you know, so really fast resilience. And here in Canada, um, all of the national parks that have been created in the last decade have either been led or co-led by First Nations. And so again, these, these important shifts, and I just saw this a couple of days ago in California, same sort of issue around how um, in, in that case, we speak about tribal lands, but tribal lands and marine protection as being a driver of, of um, sanctuary development and interesting and important work like this. So these nature-based solutions in the journal Nature just came out quite strongly around showing the power of them. And I was excited to see now more recognition of the impact of other species on these solutions of climate change. So elephants, and of course, because you're marine people, I knew you would also be excited as I was to think about tiger sharks. The way tiger sharks are having that impact is of course they eat animals that um, are eating the eelgrass. And so they keep the eelgrass healthier and that eelgrass is also of course capturing carbon. And I was happy to see apple uh, moving in this direction. So for me, hope really lies in the capacity of stories to transform and, and we have to think about that transformation. And I think this really matters that we are a young planet. There are, in terms of who lives here, you know, so 42% of the world's population is 25 years of age or younger. And we know across geographic and uh, socioeconomic studies that the two values that keep coming up for that age group are social justice and climate change. 
And that's why people are talking about climate justice activism, not climate activism. It's around the justice piece. And that piece is around the transformation, not just about sustaining what is. <laughs> Sorry. Um, that was a highlighted enthusiasm from, I believe that's Vanerf. Uh, so if we look at student guides to the climate crisis, if you look uh, through, in this case, this is one put together by students in Manchester in England, it's exciting to see things like emotions, like climate grief, right there in the table of contents, that recognizing our mental health is really critical to the way that we engage with climate change. And things like allyship and how we work in an intersectional way. You know, these sorts of issues are really dominant in climate justice, youth activism. And um, one of the ways we see this manifested is in this mashup of art and science. This is, again, one of the surprising positives out of a terrible pandemic is this real rise in art making and hobby craft making, which maybe some of you have been involved in. So we have people knitting, you know, their way into making their climate activism more known. And if you want to, you can go into this site and see the warming strikes. This is for British Columbia. You can look at them for wherever you're located. Nigeria, I'm happy to hear someone's here from there um, and see what those are. And then this site encourages you to use them in whatever way you want to. So you can place them on anything you want as an expression of, of your concern around climate warming. Um, also singing. You know, there's been a real, the Sunrise Movement is a very powerful group of youth justice activists using their voices as voices have often been used in the past and choirs really involved in this sort of thing. Um, we see it in playlists and in TikTok campaigns and in, you know, thinking about solar punk, which is these visions of what the world will look like if we act in the ways that we know we, we should um, and other forms of art making. And I also really wanted to touch on really claiming our own power, our own identities, the things that call to us as our own forms of self-expression, because a lot of, I would say a lot of the climate um, communication and environmental communication more broadly for many years has been a white middle class sort of um, movement. And it's talked about, you know, the five things we could all do that are the same but we really are not in that period anymore. We are in a period that claims our, our unique identities. Um, one group that I've been really enjoying following this last year is the Intersectional Environmentalist Council. And that's a group comprised of social media influencers who self-identify in lots of different ways um, and, and choose those identities as the platform through which they talk about their climate activism. And I think that's a really important place for us to see who cares about what you know what I care about who who is really someone I feel comfortable with Dan Cahan who does work at a Cornell University um, talks a lot about the importance of multi-voiced action because we very quickly look at someone and decide if it's someone we trust and relate with and so coming only from this expert paradigm where an expert tells us something is very restrictive that expertise matters but what matters just as much is the voices that share it, that we can readily identify with. And I thought you would enjoy this as, as people interested in science, you know, there's ways to be activists in, in many different platforms. So in this case, choosing a gender neutral scientific name as a statement um, about, about where we are on the planet right now. So one of the things I just wanted to close here and then and really go into conversation and questions is that Oftentimes, I'd say the number one thing I get asked about is that isn't, isn't it true that if you speak about hopeful things, people will become complacent? And that's a problem because these are urgent issues. And the thing I, I can say with real confidence is that if you look across the psychological literature, there's not much that shows hope and complacency as linked, but there's a tremendous amount that shows hopelessness and apathy linked. So when you feel hopeless about something, you tend to lose your creativity, you tend to become self-isolating, you tend to feel very fatalistic, um, you feel very disempowered, and that you're sometimes quite helpless. And so the fear of hope being complacent is not borne out. Um, and for that reason, I think choosing to be uh, in an evidence-based mindset around hope is really a powerful political decision. And because hope is contagious, I really encourage people to imagine themselves as hope activists and to spread hope. Um, just before we 
come off of this share. I found this on the existential toolkit and I really like it. So I was going to um, perhaps encourage us when we get together in a moment, maybe there's someone you want to toast who's on this workshop with you, who's doing something that you think is really impressive in terms of, of, of their, their you know, contributions to the kind of world we want to have. Or maybe you want to hail somebody who's not here, but is doing something that's really noteworthy or meaningful to you. Or you want to boast about your, something you're doing. So um, in addition to questions and looking at our polls, I really love some toasts and hails and boasts um, because it helps us to see what each other's doing. And so I'm going to just pop off of here now. And maybe we could start, Alexa, by could you share the poll results with us, please? So here are the results for that first icebreaker poll. Okay. The first question, it seems like mostly everyone does feel some impacts from ego anxiety. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it, they feel it in their work as well. Mm -hmm. And so important to know, um, one of my colleagues says, and I, I hope I can say this properly because sometimes I get it not, it gets twisted in my mouth, but um, it's a really legitimate way to feel about, you know, when one is inundated with an awareness of really crucial problems that you care deeply about, it's healthy to feel that way, you know, like it's a reaction, a really reasonable reaction. Um, and it's also being fueled by a lack of awareness or exposure to solutions. Yeah. So thank you. Thank you for your honesty and for sharing that. And then it makes me sad to see it. Yeah. Thank you. Hmm. And recognizing this hope gap. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. And, and probably if you were to ask others, um, maybe other people in your family or your colleagues, you know, it'd be interesting as a conversation starter around this whole question. Well, thank you. Okay. Good. Yeah, and I'd be curious with the solutions. Um, maybe in our conversation, which, what would help you to come from a solutions orientation more often? What could help that happen more? Yeah, thank you. Great, great. Thanks, Alexa, yeah. So, hails, boasts, and toasts, is that right? Or uh, questions, or challenges, or, things that you think could help you come from this perspective and you're wondering about any of those things. I, is it possible for people to unmute themselves, Alexa, and just um, maybe they can raise their hand and you could call on them if that's all right. I think that's a great way forward. Yeah, thank you. Awesome, nice. Thank you for turning on your cameras. It's so kind <laughs> when you do that. And I totally also understand that's not always possible for people depending on what environment you're in. <laughs> That's now Richard. Uh, she has something to say too. A lot, a lot going on back here. Samantha, I see your hand up. Yeah, I felt like I could maybe get the ball rolling. No one wants to go first. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wanted to thank you very much for a very interesting presentation. I've, I've had your book on my to read list for mm -hmm. a long time. So to see that you were presenting today was really, was really exciting to me. And I'm looking forward to reading your book. Thank you. It's fascinating. I, one of my first jobs when I was an undergrad student was to work in an environmental museum. Mm -hmm that I was taught to talk about anything this was you know a decade ago uh, the, the the terminology they used was the ped the pedagogy of hope mm -hmm. of accidents I was I, I still remember because it was such so striking to me you must teach hope as you're talking about mm -hmm. thing here today and uh, people come in and they're, they're, they've already made the choice to come to this environmental museum they know so the most important thing is they have to leave here with hope and mm -hmm. think that's it's stuck with me since then and it's gonna it's really amazing to see that mm. fledge and and really become a part of the movement but what i wanted to do is i wanted to toast to someone who's here unless she's left oh i see her i'm gonna call <laughs> her. 
Um, not because she's one of the only people I know on, on the line right now, but partially it. But I'd like to raise a toast to Sam Jones, who's an incredibly inspiring PhD researcher, uh, but who also dedicates a lot of her time to arts and poetry. And she uses her writing and her capacity to see beauty and wordsmithing to really get people to engage on things that matter to her and matter to all of us through that medium. So when we talk about, you know, STEAM and STEM and really making sure that hobby craft and, and arts gets integrated in these movements, I always think of Sam Jones as the perfect example of when he's doing amazing work with that. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. That's so kind. <laughs> Sam, if you feel so motivated to uh, post a poem in the chat, that would be, or to share one with us, that would be wonderful. Yeah, I had a recent um, collaboration with a few partners around UN Oceans Week, so I'll put a link to that. There's a multimedia clip with some poetry and visuals um, and sounds, so I'll, I'll put that in the chat. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Thank you. Yeah, it's funny, it makes my skin automatically get tight, you know, like excited. So thank you. I see some toasts in the chat that I think are important to read. A toast to Hallie for her important work and passion for coastal community well-being. That was second. A toast to Naomi and Emily for always challenging the norm, keeping folks curious about all things marine. I see Emily, you also have your hand up if you wanted to share. Yeah, thank you for handing over the mic. Um, and thank you, Ellen, for your presentation. Uh, this is exactly, I feel like the medicine I needed today and in the past few weeks. So yeah, I'm, I'm just really grateful for, for you coming here and for this space through Meopar. Um, so something I've been thinking about, I think it's important to say that I'm a settler. So I'm a settler on Mi'kmaq territory now, but I'm originally from Biafic territory. And so, I mentioned that because I think it framed my question, and my question is thinking about something about I've been encounter I've been encountering recently is that like it's often a very white, especially a white feminine, white woman thing to say like peace, love, joy, like look at hope, and I absolutely wholeheartedly agree with your points about hope and taking that position as a political act, and I'm 100% there. But then it also feels some friction about being like like hopeful and like positive, like I don't wanna be the toxic positive person either. So I'm wondering if you have any thoughts or reflections on balancing hope as well as allowing space for your feelings of grief and not using hope to the point of toxic positivity. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm just, yeah, this is, this is what I'm working with right, right now. <laughs> no, so, so beautifully said and, and so important. You know, we are such, multifaceted beings and we hold many emotions at the same time and there's a lovely researcher named Lisa Kretz and one of the things they talk about is um, the importance of these outlaw emotions you know emotions that we often don't feel comfortable to say out loud and yet are so critically important to how we are experiencing things things like grief and anger and despair and and I'm really in line with what they're saying is is a sense that um, I, I think we will always have all of these emotions all together. And it's, it's the creating a safe space to show the multiplicity of those feelings. And at the same time, recognizing um, what contributes to our feelings and therefore helping our own um, sense of well-being and our own emotional landscape by saying, you know, wow, I really am feeling quite hopeless about this. And is there, you know, is there a way I can look at what is going on around that issue, you know, because part of what's fueling my hopelessness is, you know, I, I tend to experience it myself when something I really care about, and then I see a headline that is just like, I, I almost think I can't recover from the headline I just saw, you know, it looks so dire. And then I just make a practice where I feel what I'm feeling. I allow myself that space to really feel it. And then I set to work on using every keyword I can think of to try and find out, you know, what are what is happening around that issue? What's what's also going on there that isn't in that story, but which I'm pretty confident is happening. And I, I will say I 
I haven't yet, I'm sure it's possible, but I have not yet found an issue where there aren't uh, a lot happening. And it, that really fuels me. And it allows me to know, oh, there are others who care about that too. And that matters to me. And then what they're doing. And then how might I best bring what I can most bring to that thing that I care about. So I agree with you. I think I, I, I don't know if I had, or if I said, you know, hope is often seen as this Pollyanna, like skipping through the tulips and cheer, smiling all the time. You know, that's, that's not at all what I mean. I mean, the, the sense of really um, kind of trusting in the, in the meaningful present and, 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 and my contributions of what I can bring to the future based on building on those who are moving in the direction that I, I think we need to amplify. Yeah, but honoring all our feelings. So thank you for that. And you, you said it so beautifully. I wish I could be as beautiful in my answer, but that's really well said. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Alexa, do, you, do I have capacity time for a follow-up question? Great, okay. So yeah, thank you so much for your response. Just as a small follow-up, I was wondering if you personally, I, I'm assuming all folks on the call today, including myself, we all are working students. I happen to be doing both, so I'm working and I'm a student. So we have big schedule, busy, busy. And I'm wondering, in your personal experience, how do you structure and a practice of gratitude and hope into your personal life? Mm. Yeah, that's such a good question. And I will say, I think one of the ways of uh, eco-anxiety that's important is, is, is sometimes recognizing that it, someone else can carry this thing for a little bit while, while you take a break, <laughs> you know, because you are going to school, you are doing those things rather than this sort of relentless belief that, you know, you must be on this 100% of the time because it's an urgent issue. Yes, it's an urgent issue, but we are a, a big collective of people. And sometimes it's your turn to rest um, and really allowing yourself to rest, I think it's, and, or recharge in ways that don't feel so um, directed can be really helpful. I think my own personal practice is I, I have the incredible good fortune in life that I talk to many, many, many people about hope on a regular basis. And so I feel like I am constantly hearing about good things that people are doing and developments I never would have known about. And, and that just fuels me really, really makes a difference. You know, I was hearing from kids yesterday about salmon enhancement in the Don River in downtown Toronto. And, I, you know, I, I didn't know about that. And I'm pretty excited about that. And I, I grew up near that river, and it didn't have any salmon in it when I was that age, you know, so it's, it's exciting for me to hear these things and then know that they're happening. Thank you a lot. A lot of folks are echoing these sentiments in the in the chat. I do think there has been a, a really big struggle, particularly among youth and feeling like we have to take on everything. We have to do all this work. And there are so many things competing for our demands that sometimes, you know, it is it is hard to take time for ourselves. Mm -hmm. uh, I think there has been a narrative that, well, you know, this is this is on the youth to solve. And like you said, sometimes it's it's our turn to rest. We can only do so much and knowing what's in our capacity, mm -hmm. um, but really taking time to to figure out what you need to 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 be functioning well and thriving and not just in this survival mode. And I think there's this really popular narrative where, you know, we're you're maybe in a master's degree or you're you're doing your PhD or in your postdoc life and this this sense of overwork and, and trying to do so many things just perpetuates itself and we are moving so fast at a rate that's just simply not sustainable. And we haven't really been taught to prioritize rest and our own well-being. And so I encourage you to try to find either it's just five, 10 minutes a day to just practice stillness to just try to find a place where you can remove all sensory simulations. Sometimes I'll sit under my desk and I'll cover my eyes and I'll just practice breathing, just taking a second to come down. And sometimes it, you don't know when this is necessarily the right moment to do it, but if, if you're feeling that sense of you know, overwhelm and tired and, and just five minutes, even one minute sometimes can make a huge difference. Mm -hmm. Yes, and yes. And there's uh, some interesting research around celebration. So when you are in an activist capacity, um, there's always the next thing that needs to be done always. And so it's really important to celebrate efforts. 
even if the thing didn't turn out at that moment just as you wished, but the effort to get there is, is a positive contribution. And then to celebrate the things when they do go that well, but to sort of recognize that um, we know from Panu Pakala's work in Finland and others that we, we are at a higher risk of burnout uh, because of because of your engagement with marine issues, you know, and so so just recognizing that we I often think it's very interesting with the um, emergency health workers, you know, we put in their codes of practice that they have to do self care before they head out on another difficult call, but we don't do that for ourselves engaged in these issues, and I think it's it's really paramount that we think in those ways. We're in a high risk profession, we're high risk students. Um, and we need to take care of ourselves and each other. And that's why I'm really excited. That one of the things I see in the climate justice movement is a thoughtfulness about younger children by older children as marches, for example, or thinking of activities for others. And I will just touch on that intergenerational piece that came up a little bit earlier. There's just a research from new, uh, new scientists in King's College in London looking at the US and the UK. And one of the things they found there is often we think as younger people that the older generation doesn't care about this or is not willing to make changes. And across those age groups, there's, there's high levels of concern across. Now, now that doesn't, I think what I'm trying to say there is, um, it's, it's right to be called out as an older person for the way things have evolved. And it's also important to work in these intergenerational ways because that's where we're the most powerful. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna share a slide here. Um as we continue this discussion. Mm -hmm. I want folks to know that they are not alone. And if you are in crisis mode or are looking for immediate support and you cannot turn to friends, family, loved ones, um, there are options online to find hotlines in your area. I posted a link um, it's quite efficient. Maybe there are some local groups in your area, local grieving groups. There's one at Dal. Eco Grief meets every Thursday, 5 to 7, in the College of Sustainability in the Mona Campbell Building. I'm certain that there are likely others in your area. And if there's not, perhaps maybe this is something that you can consider starting if this is of interest to you. I also want to turn some attention to professionals, uh, Jeff Darcy and Nancy Blair. Um, these are two folks that I found online that specialize in work around eco-anxiety. Um, Jeff Darcy is here with us today, offers walk and talk sessions. These are just a few resources that are out there um, if you are in a crisis mode and, and are looking for additional support. Thank you, Alexa. It's really great to share that. It's really great. And um, I know the students at the uh, university in Montreal uh, have started these tea sessions where people get together to share their feelings in conversation like that. So that idea of peer peer support too, as you started out, is, is such a such an important one. And one thing I might add to that is I think one of the things you might bring to those sessions, in addition to your feelings and and what's going on for you, it is a good place to start talking about this importance of evidence based solutions that actually are happening because often when we're in that mode, we really aren't aware of that. So that's something that we can also contribute. Thanks, Alexa. There's another question in the chat um, that I'll read out loud. Um, someone has decided to avoid news websites um, because they end up doom scrolling. And then when they feel like they're in their head in the sand and then they're worried they're missing on important events. So how do you keep up to date without increasing the anxieties? I echo the sentiment deeply. <laughs> yeah, and I think again, I think that's a healthy, re understandable response. <laughs> you know that you recognize what's happening to you. So again, I would really encourage um, signing on to things like the Grist, you know, which brings you regular news uh, on a on a you know a timely basis, but that is focused in a solutions journalism perspective. So I, I myself spend a lot of time in solutions journalism uh, sites looking at things. And then I find if I'm mostly there, then when I see a report that is only in a problem identification way, I get a little impatient with it. You know, I'm sort of like, come on, that's only half the story. Let's, let's do more work. You know, I get a, a little irritated with, because I think it's, um, um, it's not the whole story and I, and I expect more. And so sometimes I'll even contact the journalist and say, you know, I, what work have you done to say, what are people doing about that issue? So that I have just as much timely information about that as I do about the issue itself. And, and that's led to some really wonderful conversations. So I think asking our, our journalistic sources for what we want, which is to understand the issues for certain 
and what ought to understand what is happening, the state of play. I'm wondering if folks who are tuning in today have any good news stories that they've heard recently that they'd like to share and mm -hmm. maybe leaving us on a, on a hopeful note. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and again, those evidence-based ones, right? Things that we know we can really count on. There's so much richness in the chat. I'm sorry, I'm just reading as I'm as we're here together. Yeah. And any challenges? Again, anything that's come up for you that you feel is, um, you know, you're not so comfortable with. <laughs> I'm going to go out on a whim here and maybe hope that this helps someone, but I oftentimes get into the the really negative spiral of thinking what our future is going to look like. And I've been working really hard on manifestations and turning statements into will statements and trying to will the future and will the outcomes that I'd like to see. And so I've oftentimes, instead of going down that, that doom and gloom scenario, been trying to really envision what a healthy future could look like for our planet. And maybe that is a little corny for some folks, but I have found recently that using my imagination in thinking of all the possibilities that could happen is hopeful for me. And even if it's just a thought process and maybe that outcome won't, we won't get to that, you know, ideal, you know, future, I think that can set a, a really strong precedent for the, mm -hmm. the train of thought that we go down. Lexi, you're raising such a beautiful example of sort of these narratives that we live within, you know? And so if you look at the typical environmental narratives, the, the most dominant one is a dystopian narrative, you know, that we're sort of in a, a ruined world and we see lots of films that way and uh, lots of uh, fiction that way. In fact, a lot of the climate change fiction is, is in that dystopian framing. Mm -hmm. um, and then there is the narrative of Noble Bright, which is kind of one shining hero to come and save us. And I, I think sometimes Greta Thunberg is put in that position and she's, she's not choosing that herself, but is sometimes put there as, you know, a person to save us. But then there's this growing narrative of hope punk and Hope Punk says, you know, we act in the best ways that we know and, and sort of trust that collectively they, they will play out in the ways that we really want them to. And Hope Punk is really tied very closely to another narrative called Solar Punk, which is in just as you were doing, Alexa, this, this future orientation that says, okay, what does it look like then when we do move in the ways that we know from Hope Punk? What's that future look like? And there's some beautiful... Um, people illustrating in that a lot of it is in uh, sort of future cities looking uh, you know that kind of thing and that can then take you into a really some beautiful examples of, of um, cities that are that are in fact envisioning that and carrying it out now today you know so it's it, it's really helpful to be aware of the narratives that we are co-constructing um, so I, I don't think it sounds light at all I think it's a very powerful thing to co-construct the kinds of futures based on what we know is important and the good work that is being done how we amplify it to get there those Let's manifestations see. and willings can really go so far I have mm -hmm. post-its by my bed of positive affirmations and things that I want to see happen and I write it as if it's already happening and they're everywhere and they are corny but they work. I've noticed that when I don't have them, I slip into that negative kind of line of thought. And when I do have my positive affirmation post-its, it works. Yeah. yeah. And remember that your thoughts that you're getting on a regular basis are being fueled by this problem identification dominance. You know, it's, it's over 90% of what you're hearing about climate change is in a problem orientation. So it's, it's really true that you will quickly you cannot help it because emotions are contagious. You know? So you're, you're actively challenging that, which is exciting. Thanks, Alexa. 
Alexa, can I ask you to stop sharing your screen just so I can see people? Would that be okay? That's great. Thank you. Yeah, people are putting other things into the chat. Any other last ideas or questions or things you want to hail or toast or boast about? Um, I have an example, Alex. I think you were asking for, or someone was asking for recent examples of solutions orientation. So it's not exactly a recent specific example, but something I'm working through in my master's uh, because I'm collaborating with Indigenous partners as part of my thesis research. I originally, it, this has just been an evolution over the past year where I really started from a point where I was like, I'm a settler, I'm doing research, and there's a lot of colonial research history where um, there's been extractive and abusive research in Indigenous communities by researchers and academic institutions, especially settler researchers. And so I was coming in with all of this on my back and wanting to do research in a good way. And I was very much in that doom mindset as in, I couldn't see how I was gonna take thesis in a respectful way. But since then I've taken oh, indigenous- Emily, we research. suddenly can't hear you. Oh, now we can, sorry, you go ahead. Okay, great. Sorry, that might be my headphones, that happens sometimes. Anyways, <laughs> I was saying, I, um, I have mentors now and I've done some like practical research methodology courses and doing a lot of reading to reorient myself. Um, yeah, and basically my, that solution story is basically going from the point of being like, I'm helplessly a colonial being to realizing that I can use my power and my research to be decolonial, anti-colonial and align myself with methods and practices that empower and respect indigenous sovereignty. So that's, that's my, narrative and example from my research. I hope you folks can still hear me. <laughs> oh, that's a that's a beautiful example. And I, I, I really appreciate that as, as those of you who are students on the call or academics working with students, you know, this, this really challenging ourselves to like, first of all, see that I'm in that, that narrative and how I, how you flipped it. I mean, that's really an exciting thing. And there's a person named Josh Sinner, who has been studying why certain coral reefs do better than others, even though they may be, you know, close to a million people, that sort of thing. So it's 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 studying um, why successes happen uh, rather than which reefs are the most degraded, you know. So why why are these these outlier reefs in a way? And what he told me is that in terms of publishing his academic work it's much harder for him to get these solutions oriented papers published because just as in our um, media, we also within our academic journals have a real focus on problem identification and not very much on solutions orientation. Uh, but when he does get one published, it tends to be shared the most widely of all of his work. And so in that way, he feels it's very influential. And so it's really helpful to know that so that you, when you go to publish your good work might expect that and then, you know, just know that to persevere really will matter because it'll influence others. And then for other students, I think to, to ask for more solutions orientations in the course, you know, like if I'm in a course and it's really a problem identification one, to ask the prof for that solutions orientation or to say, I would like to do my assignments from a solutions orientation, or I am going to, you know, this sort of thing where, um, you know, where we exercise our own power around wanting a full or more fulsome picture if that if that's the case yeah it's a beautiful example thank you hello i am uh i'm jeff darcy actually one of the therapists that was listed on the previous screen great and uh, i just wanted to put a, va of a face and a voice to the name um i'm fortunate enough to be um, living and working and playing on the uh, unceded traditional territories of the Squamish, Musqueam, and Tsleil-Waututh people. Mm -hmm. um, but in what that actually means is I actually live in a high-rise apartment building uh, right near Stanley Park. And so I have this amazing opportunity, and especially during the pandemic, to meet with clients at their discretion and at their interest um, 
and do our sessions as walk and talk therapy um, mm -hmm. in Stanley Park. And um, just having nature as a holding environment has a whole host of benefits. I used to actually be a naturalist where I um, taught environmental education for many years in the Redwood Forest. Mm. Um, and then I was an environmental engineer uh, enforcing the Clean Air Act um, mm. down in San Francisco and the whole Western region. But it was, it was this connecting to individuals sense of separation. Mm. And in Buddhist psychology, that's often considered the fundamental source of human suffering is this erroneous sense of separation that we're alone existentially in this world mm. and it's a it's an illusion and part of meditation is to wake up from that illusion of separation mm. and to recognize our interdependence with the entire web of life mm. as a pathway to mental health and wellness um, and the other like kind of trick i wanted to leave you all with comes from tara brock who is both a uh, buddhist teacher but also a psychologist she has a weekly podcast but she talks about this acronym RAIN, R-A-I-N, as a useful um, tool to process whatever emotions you, you might be going through in the moment. And so the R stands for recognize, the mm -hmm. A is for allow, the I is for investigate, particularly investigating how you're experiencing that emotion in the body. And then the N is for nurture is mm. to do all of this in a gentle, nurturing um, way, because it's hard to face emotions. It's like mm. our normal instinct when we're facing something like grief or um, uh, anger or uh, anxiety is to want to avoid it and run the other way and be like, I can't think about what's actually going on here. Mm. And Tara challenges us to see what would happen if we actually allow those emotions to be there and not fight them or not necessarily want to fix them, even with a solution, mm -hmm. but to just be curious rather than judgmental about whatever sensations mm -hmm. the emotions are bringing up. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Mm -hmm. And I will, uh, mm -hmm. many of you are not local in Vancouver. And at this point, still at least half of my clients are uh, on video. So that's uh, another easy way to um, meet with people. If anyone is curious, my contact information, and I'll put it back in the chat. Thank you. Thanks so much, Jeff. Beautiful. Just being mindful of time, we have about seven minutes left. I'm wondering if there are any last few comments, questions, remarks from folks in the audience. I'm definitely going to have to check out more of Tara Brock's work. I am not familiar. Mm -hmm. Seems like a few folks here are big fans. Yeah, yeah, and I, I, I think it's just such a. It's. I think what is always challenging around this is that it, it because we, we. Uh, are so immersed in with our deepest passions around the ocean environment and our concerns around it is it's really does take a lot of practice to feel our feelings and also to um to see these things that are shifting i think it, it just is it's a thing to really continuously it's a practice i guess that's what i mean and um i'm so grateful to have this opportunity to meet with all of you and and uh Again, as I said, Alexa, I think you were very clear about recognizing this as an issue, which clearly the polls are showing is a shared issue amongst your group and, and many groups. And so we aren't alone in these feelings at all. And they are they're understandable feelings and important feelings. And we're also that means we can be so supportive of one another in those how we how we can feel those feelings and looking at how we um, amplify the kinds of good works that we're doing. I really appreciate this time and I really appreciate what a great week you have ahead of you. I was looking at your whole agenda. It looks wonderful. And as an ocean person, it just fills my heart to see that. 
Thank you so much, Ellen, for your inspirational and hopeful outlook on how to manage our emotions in this climate crisis. I can tell by how active the chat has been that this has been a very valuable session for so many of us. And again, I want to thank all of our participants who were comfortable enough to share. Um, it means the world to not just myself, but uh, I'm sure many of us are in the same boat and grateful for the support of one another. Thank you so much, everyone.